What is this life if full of care we have no time to stand and stare? Those famous lines were written by W.H. Davis, born in Newport, South Wales. This week's venue for the Antiques Roadshow. Newport's river is the Usk, and the Romans set up a fortress at nearby Caerleon, bringing in supplies from all over their empire for 200 years. But Newport itself was just a small fishing and market town until the coming of the Industrial Age at the beginning of the 19th century. The town rapidly grew and flourished. The canal system was used to bring down coal and iron from the valleys for shipment, and soon Newport docks were doing more business than almost any other port in the United Kingdom. Two miles from the town centre stands Tredegar House, home of the Morgan family, who played an important part in developing the fortunes of the area. They lived here in splendour for over 500 years, their estates stretching through Monmouth, Glamorgan and the Brecon Beacons. The town's favourite member of the family was Godfrey. He donated land generously to establish Newport's health and education facilities. Godfrey Morgan himself had been to hell and back. To be precise, he took part in the charge of the Light Brigade and he was so grateful to have survived the carnage that when his horse, named Sir Briggs, finally died, he had him buried here in the garden at Tredegar House, along with his dog Peeps, who was said to haunt the building. The last and probably the most colourful occupant of Tredegar House was Evan Morgan. Extravagant and self-indulgent, he entertained on a lavish scale. His weekend house parties were legendary. Evan's own party piece was to let his pet bloom a core climb up the inside of his trouser leg and then peep out at an unexpected moment. And if that didn't amuse his guests, they could always go into the garden and watch his boxing kangaroo. Or they could try the Kevin Mabley shovelboard. It's a simple game, shovelboard. Each player takes a brass disc and takes it in turn to slide the disc down the table. The person whose disc gets furthest without coming off the table wins the game. It's a mixture of shove halfpenny and curling, really. Here it goes. In 1974, a bright new chapter began for the former home of the Morgans when Newport Borough Council bought Tredegar House and 90 acres of parkland. The country's grandest council house was recently voted one of the top tourist attractions in Britain. And now let's join our team of experts at the Newport Centre for this week's Antiques Roadshow. You collect miniatures, dear? Yes, I do. <laughs> Where do you keep it? On the wardrobe. On a wardrobe? On the wardrobe, yes, oh, yes. wonderful. Has it always stood on the wardrobe? No. When my mother was alive, it was on a piano in the front room. What, an upright piano? An upright piano. Well, it was quite risky on there. Yeah. It was a topple over. Yeah. Well, these were never made for use. No. So I shouldn't think he's ever seen tea. Yes, it does. It has? It has, yes. What, you've had tea in this? No. Well, my, my grandmother, when she lived in Kidwelly, they used it in the street parties. No. Yes, yeah. How extraordinary. Yeah. What a Kidwelly wonderful idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they weren't actually made for use. Yeah. Um, they were display pieces which were either made by a manufacturer to show how clever he was yeah. and to advertise his wares, mm -hmm. or more often they were in uh, the window of a tea shop. The fact that it's been used is really rather wonderful. There was 144 breakfast cups of tea. You've measured it, have you? Oh, my, my mother always <laughs> said that, you know. Yeah. Really? I can believe it. Yeah. Um, it's made in Staffordshire. Yeah. The basic design is transfer printed yeah. in black, yeah. and then all the colours have been added by hand. And it dates from about 1860 to 1880, Good somewhere gosh. around there. So it's a pretty ancient pot, really. Yeah. One suspects that when it was made, it was silver plated all over. Yeah. And you can see remnants of the plate remaining on here. But of course, it's been polished off on the lid, and this is so common yeah. to find yeah. that but at least it's retained the lid. What's nice about it is the design is so chinoiserie. It is Cathay. It is the English idea of the mythical East. And that, of course, ties up with tea. Yeah, so yeah. it's an appropriate yeah. Chinese design. You know, they're quite collectible because people, you know, love them for display. And I think it would probably make in a sale 600 to a thousand pounds. Oh gosh. Oh yeah. So we I don't know that it deserves to be seen on top of a wardrobe. No, it doesn't. Exactly. No, no. Thank you very, very much for struggling in with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, at an old people's home, and they were, um, someone came into the home, and uh, sort of all the stuff from the house was put into a fair, and I bought it out of the fair for about 20 pence. Right. Biscuits, when they first came on the market, were often sold in elaborate tins and packaging, I think really to promote the biscuits. Mm. And by the 1920s, 1930s, you could buy trains, planes, you know, you name it, a biscuit tin was made yes. in that form. Now, this, of course, has meant that people have lost interest in the biscuits, but, of course, they collect the tins. Yes. Now, here we have one called the Meteor, a racing car of the 1930s. It's very loosely based on a car that was driven by Sir Henry Seagrave, but only up to a point. And it's a very stylish, streamlined image in wonderful sort of flowing um, colours. And as you go along, I like the way the wheels um, have this sort of dynamic pattern to them. Um, inside would be the biscuits. What have we got? Oh, no biscuits, but we've got, <laughs> we've got some wood binds. We have. <laughs> so you can have a smoke if you can't have a biscuit. And, of course, many of these then were thrown away when they were empty. They were simply a novelty item. As a result, they're quite rare. Collectors are very keen to buy them. They've been documented. There was even an exhibition in the v &A in London years ago What's on that? biscuit tins. The remarkable thing about this one is that it is effectively brand new. There's very little marking on it. The only thing missing is there would have been a headlight there. Yeah. Um, with, with a switch here, and so you could actually push it along in the dark with the headlight glowing, which would have been more exciting. But otherwise, it's pretty immaculate. Now, great car, great 1930s styling, 20p. Yes, 20p. <laughs> so, I think it's worth quite a bit more than that now. I yes. think you did very well. Um, how about £200? Mm -hmm. Do you think that <laughs> sounds good? Well, I have been told it was a bit worth a bit more than that. Have you? <laughs> yes. What, what, were you, what were you told? Well, about a thousand. No. 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 I think that's a bit... Uh, I, I, I would say no. that was too much. That's I would say in the condition it's in, mm. with the light and everything like that missing, two or three hundred would be oh, about right. It uh, belonged to my uncle, who was uh, an antique dealer in Bristol, and he died in 1980. And it was his wish that uh, I chose one of his paintings. Mm. And this is the one that I chose. You're well, quite right, too. I mm. think you made a good choice. Now, the picture is signed, and it's signed with a monogram down yes. here and yes. a date, 1878. I think I know who that monogram is, but what's your...? I believe it's Albert Ludovici. Yes, yes. And there's a junior and a senior. Absolutely right. I well, I don't know which one it is. I would agree. I think this is by uh, one of the Albert Ludovicis. Now, they were both Italian as the name might suggest, but they both, in fact, came to live in London yes. and also lived in Paris. And I've puzzled over this, but I really find it difficult to know which Ludovici this is. It might yes. be by the father, it might be by the son. The date is possible for either of them. And they similar styles, are they? Yes, they do paint in similar styles. Yeah. I incline towards the opinion that it's by Ludovici Jr. And it's typical of both the Ludovici style. It's slightly sort of sketchy and impressionist. Uh, but he does paint these charming pictures of, of children with little rather round, smiling, rosy faces. That's, that's typical of, of, of Ludovici. And is he a musician? What, what do you think this is here? Yes, I believe he's a musician. And this is his, his organ here. So this ah, is the I organ see. So grinder, he's an organ grinder with his monkey. Yeah. Yes, well, this is it. And in villages, of course, in, in those days, this is in the late 19th century, not much happened, and no. therefore the arrival of an entertainer like this was a big village event. Yes. Everybody turned out, so here they are all following him, and uh, he's heading for the pub by the look of it. Yes. yes. Well, it's the in, frame is original. It was yes, as, as that's it a was. nice period frame. It's in good condition, and therefore, in a sale now, I would reckon this painting would make at least five or six thousand pounds. Right. It, it might make more because it's such a nice subject, and I'd certainly suggest insuring it for, say, seven and a half thousand. Okay. So, a very charming picture, and Thank you very delighted much. to have it. Oh my goodness, I can see why you've got a problem with it. You've got the hunting horn of Chantilly, but it's a very grey piece of porcelain. Very English looking. With a drilled sev mark, a yeah. sev hole in it, but it's been drilled through the glaze. Yeah. Someone's trying to have two cakes and eat, it, eat them. Yeah, it's amusing, isn't it? And then. This pattern, the, the squirrel pattern, is a Kakiemon pattern done in a sort of Chinese Family Rose style <laughs> on a plate that is actually English with a French Chanty mark, mark and the drilled hole for Sèvres. Simple. I you can't see, see what you your see problem, problem was. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> I just, 
Yeah. <laughs> where, do you, where do you think it was done? I think it's English. It's incompetent enough to be English. But do you know, this, this crackleur in the glaze, I, I, don't, I honestly don't know. But it's fun, isn't it? It's terrific fun. Right, thank you very much. Lovely. We're no further forward. I'll get, break the good news to the end. I understand that uh, this was made by my wife's grandfather uh, during the Second World War. And apparently it's a device for dealing with incendiary bombs that may well fall through your ceiling. Um, so how does it go together? Apparently one combines these two halves like that. You then have a rake with which you can reach into the eaves of the house and pull the incendiary device towards you. And if one is very careful and doesn't hit anybody right <laughs> about, we can scoop up the incendiary device and get rid of it. But was this just a one-off, or were these sort of standard issues? What, what? what I find interesting, uh, apparently this was a one-off, but uh, one of your experts this morning told me that he collected, when he was a child, Will's uh, cigarette cards, and there were pictures of ARP issue, and that's what prompted him that this might well be the use for which this was designed. So we have a bit of 60-year-old, genuine war Memorabilia. Fabulous. I had it as a small boy, and uh, it was from my mother's cousin that gave it me. Right. And that was about 1930. But it's older than that, isn't it? Well, maybe so. I, I think it was in a broken box when I had it. Right. But of course, that's been lost because as a child we played with it so often. Yeah. Now, it's a fairly traditional game, I should say. I think it's called Dread Norton Submarine. Yes, I think like that. that was the name yeah. on the box, yes. Now, I've never done it. So will you allow me to yes. drive the submarine? All right. You can, you can be the ship's captain. OK. So you're, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so you're yes. sailing along the high seas. That's right. And I'm coming along in my submarine. And I'm coming into position. Aim. Fire. Hey! <laughs> you really made my day. I've always wanted to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, I suppose we have to think about value. First made probably sometime in about 1910, in production probably for a long time, as a standard popular toy. Because it's all here, had its great fun, I think a collector might pay sort of 20 or 30 pounds for it. But that's not the point. The great thing is, it works. Yes. <laughs> and I can see why you enjoyed it so much. I'd, I'd like to have another go now. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh. Let's rebuild it. This bear has an absolutely charming action, and uh, if, we, if we move his tail, you get the most wonderful head movement, which I, I think is, is, is really, really fantastic. Now, I would say that he was probably just pre-war and probably about 60, 65 years old. Now, would I be right? Yes. Good, good. Now, that's, that's, that's comforting to know. Now, do you know who he's made by? Well, I've always had him, and it's really only a month ago that I noticed the button in its ear. So after all that time, you've only just discovered yes. that it was a yes, sigh thing. literally in, a month in ago. In all honesty, he's quite a valuable thing. He's in superb condition, and I have no doubt in my mind that if he were popped into a toy auction, he would make in excess of £500. Mm. It's been in the family for about 70 years. Mm -hmm. And how, was it, how did it come into the family? Well, my mother bought it when she was setting up home and when Victoriana was practically given away. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely good piece of furniture in the Gothic Revival style. Mm -hmm. Now, the Gothic Revival was really a style that dominated the 19th century in English furniture design and in architecture, mm -hmm. starting really with Pugin, who was the father of the modern Gothic Revival uh, in the 1830s and 40s. But this piece belongs to the second generation of Gothic Revival. And although it's not marked in any way, I. I'm absolutely certain that it's designed by a man called Charles Bevan. Charles Bevan uh, was a professional furniture designer and he trained with an architect called John Pollard Seddon. And Seddon worked for some time uh, in Llandaff, so he has a local connection to here. There's a very well-known suite of furniture designed from a man called Titus Salt, made by Marsh and Jones and designed by Bevan. And this has many characteristics with that furniture and sufficient characteristics that one can be absolutely certain that it's from his hand. If you look at these little half round motifs with a dot in it, which is very characteristic of his work, if you look at this cut out Gothic motif here, 
and this column here. Yeah. They're all things which you absolutely find on this on this tighter salt furniture. Mm -hmm. And again, the panel in the front here, round Gothic panel with dot inlay, yeah. very, very characteristic of Bevan's work. Mm -hmm. And it's an extremely nice example. Normally, you associate Gothic Revival furniture with being in oak. Mm. But when you get to this later generation, this is made in the 1860s, this is about 1865, they used richer woods, which was more the taste of that period. Mm -hmm. So the oak sort of has, has, in a sense, faded back. In terms of value, do you have any idea what a piece like this might be worth? It was valued at between four and 600, but... Would you like some good news in that respect? Well, yeah. <laughs> I think you should really add a naught to the end of that, and I would say for insurance, mm -hmm. one's looking in terms of something like £6,000. Really? And it's a, really, it's a really very, very good example of the best sort of commercial good furniture. Enough. I nearly threw it away a few years ago. Don't throw it away, <laughs> and enjoy it. I will let him. Oh, I'm like stuck it. with it now, aren't I? You are definitely stuck. <laughs> but thank you for bringing it in, because it really is something very special. It was a wedding present to my uncle in a, the 30s, and it's passed down through the family. So you remember it since you were a I little I remember girl. it when, as a little child, it used to be on a mantelpiece, and the firelight used to reflect in the iridescence on the vase, and it fascinated me. Iridescence, that's the, that's the, that's the key to this piece. Because if you look very, very closely, you've got these beautiful areas of ruby iridescence, and then in the panels with these symmetric flower uh, motifs, you've got silver iridescence, and the whole vase is covered in this well, almost green iridescent, so it's a real mixture of colour. Do you know where it's from? Well, I did look underneath and I could, see it, I could see it was a, a Hungarian factory, but I was puzzled because of the shape and, and the arabesque style of it. Right, you're quite right. This is the mark of factory known as Finfkirchen, five churches, which explains why you've got five churches in the mark. But it now is more famously known as the Pech factory, or Zsolnay Pech, Hungarian. Um, and Hungarian, yes, I mean, it's very, very Eastern in style. I would say this owes more to Persian lacquer work than to anything mainstream Northwest European. Um, it's a gorgeous little object, a stunning object, made around the year, I think, 1900, slap bang in the middle of the Yarnovo period, um, rather later than those great English lusters made by people like William de Morgan, yeah. but they're far more swashbuckling yeah. designs. This is very, very miniaturist, fantastically well done. I mean, I, I can't keep my eyes off this. If you go around the vase, you'll see that those tones, although the pattern is quite repetitive, the tones of the luster actually do change and shimmer. It's a beautiful thing. Is it an unusual pattern or is it...? I've never seen this pattern before. Jeanne is really a factory I associate with the Art Nouveau, whereas this is far closer to Persian, almost Paisley-style motifs. I, I suppose it comes quite close to Pilkington and Royal Lancastrian over in this country. Difficult to put a value on. If you wanted to go out and replace that today, uh, you would have to be thinking in terms of insurance value of around maybe £5,000. <laughs> Oh, that's a shock. I'm amazed. Yeah. You know, speaking as a jewellery historian, if there was one thing that I really would have liked you to have brought in, it's this ring. Yeah. But it's quite an unusual ring. So where did you get it from? Well, it was handed down to me by my aunt, who, who was a lady in waiting, house, general housekeeper for Lady Shelley Rose of Rose Royce. Oh, indeed. Yes. Yeah. Oh, indeed. So there's a certain pedigree about the yes. thing, isn't there? Did you look at it and wonder about the skull motif? You can see here this rather gruesome, rather brutal-looking skull. Yes. It's not a nice ring to wear, yeah, you wouldn't have thought. No, it doesn't suit everybody's no. taste. But um, the very gruesomeness of the skull um, is a point about its date. Because in mourning jewellery, that was made, jewels that were worn when someone died. If you look at the, Vic uh, the ones that were made in the Victorian period, they're quite sanitised looking. But the early ones made in about 1720, those ones are far more yes. brutal. So the skull on this one is about 1700, 1720. Yes. And it's covered in white, which is of course white enamel. Yes. And then you've got the crossbones behind, so it looks like a pirate's flag, really. And then the shoulders are set individually with little white stones that are real diamond. diamond. 
So there's the skull. There's the table cut diamonds, as we, we would it, call it. Yes, yeah. And then you've got this sort of enamel scroll work above the skull. Yes. Then if you have a look at the side of the shank of the ring, it's also black enameled going round the edge there. So in what is, I suppose you could describe it as quite a small, compact part of the ring, it's, it's full of all sorts of different pieces. Yes. The white enamel, the black enamel, the diamonds. But most interestingly is the skull. Yeah. Something else yes. as well. Yes, I, I got a small uh, brooch, unusual brooch. I, I think it's a brooch anyway. You know. This is a very fascinating piece as well, because this was made in around about, I suppose, uh, the mid-Victorian period, so it's later than that. Yes. But what they've done is they've taken a bubble of rock crystal, they've painted it from behind with the, the bumblebee motif. They painted them with all sorts of different subjects, like herons yes. and birds like storks and cranes. Bumblebees, though, very nice. And it's one of those subjects that people love, the bumblebee. Yeah. And if we turn it over on the back, you'll see that you've got the original locket back compartment that you would have used to take something like a lock of hair or a photograph. And unfortunately, the one slight problem with it is that the original yeah. hook has been broken off it. Yes. Now, so. it's not super critical. I mean, if the, if the crystal at the front was, you know, cracked, that would make a huge difference. But yes. the fact that you can put a little hook on it, that can be done. Right, so two very different pieces, totally different periods. Um, we move on to their potential value. They're a very specific market, but they're the sort of thing that people really do like. Now, the skull ring, I think is probably worth something in the region of fifteen hundred pounds, <laughs> and it's a, it's a real it. <laughs> collector's piece that one. But the bumblebee brooch in the eighteen sixty style, I think that's worth two to three thousand pounds. Cool, surprise me. And another that that been hanging about in the box. <laughs> you thought it might have been a piece of costume jewellery or yes. something yeah. like that. Carl, Carl never really liked it. You well, know, can you know. imagine how excited I was when yeah. I saw it? Because yeah. it's such a beautiful pedigree Victorian piece. Now I can see that you must have a great passion for things costume related and obviously you've brought us some very lovely looking pieces of costume here. Um, I would like to, um, to introduce Lucy who is very kindly agreed to wear one of your most beautiful outfits and uh, I think she looks very lovely as well. She looks beautiful. This is a very typical sort of mid-twenties, what some people might call a flapper yes, dress, a flapper I, dress, I that's suppose. Quite yeah. right, yes. And um, it's a very glamorous one. Very glamorous, very nicely decorated with rhinestones. Sparkling very well. And uh, with a slip and things. And I yes. think obviously it has a few little diamantes missing or whatever. But yes, I'm afraid they do tend to drop off, um, especially with use. Yes. You have to be very, yeah. very careful yeah, with... Uh, well, they're actually extremely fragile outfits, aren't they? they? Are. And, yes. and, and silk and chiffon and, and, and very, very fragile Makes you indeed. wonder how the flappers did all they're supposed to have done Maybe with Maybe Lucy those can give us a, a quick, quick yes. turn and you can see how beautiful it is with the lace. It's lovely. Um, very, very lovely. She looks beautiful. Well, I yes. think that basically a dress like that is probably worth up to £200 at auction now, really? so I think you did, you did very well, obviously. Yes. This I particularly like because this is a, a sort of silver metallized thread yes. um, creation, which again is the same period. Uh, yes, um, it is. Maybe a little bit later, but still very straight. And, um, still very attractive. Yeah, still and very attractive. A lot of work in, in this metal thread. What's it, what I find interesting about this one is that being silvered metallized thread, it yes. hasn't in fact tarnished. They don't see daylight very often these days. Outfits like this from that period were well accessorized as well, and, and yes. certainly we've got With a the selection. Yeah, we've got a selection uh, of um, of clutch bags and yes. things here, Cakes. which I, which are in fact very beautiful and very finely made. I mean, this is a particularly it's beautiful tiny. little example, um, chain stitch and, and glass bead work with superb little enameled sort of features and decoration and, and mother of pearl stringing on the on the, the, the purse yeah. itself. I mean traditionally a very Indian form of, of decoration as well. But exquisite and, and I think certainly um, a, a good example like this is probably going to make anywhere between one and two hundred pounds at auction. Oh so you know it, it is frightening really I think because you obviously have such a good oh, it's collection. Now. There are a couple of out other outfits you've got here which again yes. interest me. I know that I've had a look at the label in this one and it's by a local Supplies Jones. Oh, um, yes. And um, Swansea, is it? Yes, that's right, of yes. Swansea. 
this is a similar period, this coat, but um, it's not of the same sort of quality. I think this would have been a more affordable piece at the time. Um, it was very typical to decorate the, the collars and things. What, what fur would you say I, that I would say that that's coney, in fact. It's coney, yes, I thought. Yeah. It was sable. Yeah, no, I think that's coney. Oh, it may, right. made to look like sable. Yes. But uh, at auction, a, a piece like that probably worth about 60 to 100 pounds. Mm -hmm. I think you have some wonderful things, and uh, I know basically that, that you have more. And this is probably only a fraction of what I, I could have possibly looked at. Where did he come from? Oh, I've had him about 20 years, I think. I, I did buy him rather cheaply. Um, a lady was clearing out some bits and pieces, and it was in the drawer, and she said, yes, you have it, you know, and uh, I've just paid a few pounds for it. Um, the head itself is beast, and um, I know you thought that, that might be real hair. It, it, I mean, yes, it does look very like It's actually mohair, oh, I think, it? yes. There are sort of various variations on this. Some of them actually had sleeping eyes, which meant that when it went from an upright position to horizontal, the eyes would actually close. And some of them also had an open mouth. But you could just see two yes, teeth. Yes, I, I have the top. actually seen bigger ones with open mouths, but um, not this small. No. no. Well, apparently they did do them, um, but just you know, th this one is a slightly more standard version. I mean, I think it's wonderful that he's still got all his you know original uh, sort of hat. Um, a lovely little thistle on the top there. Um, this is even a little sporran. I say <laughs> um, We won't look up his skirt, but we will actually because he's got little shorts underneath. Not a true Scotsman, obviously. <laughs> but I, I think he'd probably fetch something in the region of £150 to £180 at auction. I think it's lovely because he's a little lad. <laughs> in Newport, history comes at you from all sides and None of it is more significant or dramatic than what happened here in 1839, and we're talking about the Chartists, aren't we? 5,000 men, ironworkers and coal miners from the valleys of Montshire, arriving in the town in the early hours of November the 4th, 1839. And they advanced on the Westgate Hotel, where a group of soldiers were waiting. Uh, 30 soldiers of the 45th Regiment fired on the crowd, some of whom had got into the building, and they left behind some 22 men dead. They came demanding the charter, you know, the right to vote. So although they were beaten on the night, they really triumphed in the end? In the sense that five of the six points are now the law of our country in terms of voting. Um, what is the significance of this silver piece? Well, this is a testimonial plate to the mayor of Newport, Sir Thomas Phillips. Well, he wasn't Sir Thomas Phillips before the event. He became Sir Thomas Phillips as a result of it. But Thomas Phillips had been there on the night with the 45th Regiment and had suffered wounds in the hip and the arm, a very brave, heroic stand. And how did it come into your keeping? Well, in 1982, uh, a gentleman in Essex was looking for a suitable sized plate to weld into the bottom of his car, which had failed the MOT. He found this, didn't realize at first it was silver until he got it back home. Then he got a jeweler friend to clean it. Finding out what was on it, he realized it had something to do with Newport. So he communicated with the mayor of Newport and the museum bought it from him. The circle is complete. Yes. Well, this is a real mystery object. Do you know what it is? I'm sorry, I don't know. You were know. supposed to be experts, and I'm not sure that I know. Have you, any, you have no ideas? None at all, no. Sorry. Well, look, I mean, I've asked around a bit and some of my colleagues, and we came up with a few ideas, but they're not definitive by any means. Um, as to where it was made, where it came from, I think the general feeling is it's probably 19th century. It would be a complete one-off. Mm. My personal feeling is it may be something like Dutch, although another person came up with the idea it might be Iberian, mm. which tallies quite well because you have these curious animals here which look like ibex, the sort of animals you might find in the Pyrenees. Yes. Now, what is it? Turn it up like that. There are two spouts here. And they, come, they follow down here, so liquid would therefore fall out, would come out of the two mouths here of the animals. Mm. But then you pour it out onto what? It's now, another idea is that I think this is possibly a good contender, it was a, rich, a sort of lamp. So you put the, 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 lamp, the lamp fuel goes in here, there, there would be, um, a, the taper would go through into the oil, come out there and just come to the, to, to the end of the mouth here, and that would flame up, and so this would be a sort of reflector, rather like the idea of old students' lamps, which was a sort of 18th century idea. Mm. But maybe somebody else has an idea, if anybody see, no, sees this, and knows what it is, we'd be delighted to know, I must say. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Three Japanese vases. Where did you get them from? Uh, it's Worcester sale. 
The Worcester Sale? Yeah, as far as I know, yes. This is in your family? Well, yeah, from their family pieces, yeah. Japanese vases sold at a Worcester porcelain works sale, is that right? As far as okay. I know. Well, let's have a look. On the bottom, we've got that little paper label, Worcester Royal Porcelain Works Museum. Yes. And a number. Yes. Well, the sale that you refer to um, is almost certainly one that took place in about 1905. Right. So you've got to sort of stretch your family back to there. Yes. But well before that, in the 1870s, one of the proprietors of Worcester, Mr. Binns, went on a binge. He went uh, to the various exhibitions in Europe. He bought all sorts of interesting things that he saw on the stands, uh, and he brought it back to the Royal Worcester Works. Right. Uh, and many of these pieces became inspirational for the actual works that were made from then on at Worcester. Right, so they, co okay. they copied these then? They copied these. From a ceramic historian's point of view, these two particular Japanese vases are very interesting because if you just brought those to me without those paper labels, I would probably have dated them around 1900 or thereabouts. But we know documentary proof that these were bought well back in the 70s when the craze for all things Japanese was only 10 years old. Well, here he bought a, a vase with a, a relief of a large carp diving to the bottom of a pond um, and I know that that is a design or very similar to a design that we would see at Worcester actually in Worcester porcelain. Right. And here we have a piece that's been decorated in oxides of iron and other underglazed colours with this beautiful flowering prunus in which there sits a bird that's been very very finely detailed the, the potter has even taken trouble to carve out these little individual yeah, petals. Yeah. I mean, it's a really Lovely. beautiful piece. You can see why Mr. Binns was taken with it. And our third Japanese vase yeah. isn't Japanese. Yeah, that's my favorite. I like that one. It's, of course, an example of Royal Worcester aesthetic wear. It's imitating a Japanese carving done on a piece of elephant ivory tusk, and it shows these frogs having rather a lively party underneath the floating cloud of Fuji. Um, I don't know why they're looking so happy, <laughs> because round the back there is a giant snake about to devour them. So here you've got the original inspiration and a good example in Worcester of what happened once those designers got hold of these yeah. oriental works of art. See, yeah. The piece that we've got here has the classic crown mark um, and the date code for 1886. You can buy something like this at auction for somewhere in the region of maybe three to five hundred pounds. It's got a little chip on it. Mm -hmm. These two Japanese pieces probably are going to be in the region of five to eight hundred pounds each. Not a huge amount in terms no, of value, no. but hugely valuable in terms of what they can tell us about yeah. Japanese porcelain. Yeah. And if you have time one day, I'd love you to go to the Worcester Museum. They would love to see those pieces there. I'm sure they will be able to chase up the original records from those labels and perhaps even tell you how much Mr. Binns paid for them yeah. way <laughs> back in the yeah. 1870s. Yeah, OK. You have never used this nut? No, I haven't. You've never wondered I... what that was for? Well, I have wondered, but I don't know. Well, we just hang the pendulum on. I see. OK. And then this nut unscrews from this back plate. Oh, yes. Okay. And then it goes through there and it screws into the center. So you can lock your pendulum rigid. Now, when you take it home, right. it's not going to shake around. Right. Thank you. Thank you. There we That's go. Excellent. You probably know it's a skeleton clock. Yes, I had heard that actually, yes. And it's very, very typically English. Is it? About 1860 to 1865. Right. We made numerous different models of skeleton clocks. Yes. And this one is actually rather better viewed from behind because you can see the architectural plates working a bit better there. Yes. And you've got three feet to each plate. Yes. So six feet altogether. And the two plates are held in position 
by these rather nice tapering baluster pillars. Is it made of brass? Because I know it's quite heavy. It is all brass. I see. And never be tempted to clean it. That was my next question. <laughs> right. Now, the reason I say that is because if you have a crack at it, you're going to do damage. I this see. has got to be taken apart professionally by a, a clockmaker and every individual part cleaned, polished, put together, and then it will look absolutely magnificent. Yeah. But never be tempted to use any sort of abrasive on it. Because all that happens is a bit tarnish again. I see. And although the front's slightly faded, you can see that the back has a lovely, lovely grain of rosewood. Yes. It is rosewood. That it is, is rosewood, yes. yes. So there's also a provision here for a glass dome. Do you have that or not? I do have a dome. It doesn't uh, fit it properly. It isn't the correct one. I'm afraid it's cracked. But it is under cover. It does it keep is. the dust off. Right. Yeah. Worth your while having it cleaned. Is it? Yeah. Right. Which wouldn't be too expensive, but have you any idea of a figure? Well, I had it valued with a house clearance. Uh, it belonged to my father, mm -hmm. um, but when my mother died, um, I had someone to come and have a look, and it was only valued at about £150. £150? Pounds. Yes. Well, realistically, today, at auction, and I have to say at auction because it's not in retail condition at the moment, no. it would still make close to £1,000. Really? Yeah. By the time the movement had been cleaned and overhauled and polished and you had a nice dome for it, it would certainly be retailing for in excess of 2000 Is it really? So, well, I am surprised. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is excellent. I know it's called Britannia and her allies. Yes. I saw it in the sale and it didn't look as big in the sale room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, as I know that one. <laughs> well, let's have a look at it because if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, it's clearly signed by Charles Butler. I think it's called Charles Ernest Butler. And it's dated 1920, which actually is quite an interesting bit of information in itself, because according to the sort of dictionaries on Victorian Edwardian artists, we haven't got any idea about when he died. Um, and they've got him perhaps painting around 1918 and don't know of anything after that date. So it seems to me a very late work. It's a huge scale. And it seems to me as if it was painted as a sort of memorial um, in some town hall to celebrate the end of the First World War and the victory of the Allies and the Commonwealth over the Germans. Yes. So we have the central figure of Britannia and we have the Australian soldier here. Yep. I assume the Canadian here, wouldn't you say? Oh, probably, yes. And then yes. we have the Indian here, which is absolutely wonderful yes. sort of portrait. And we have our other allies. Um, America, France, they're the two easy ones to recognise. There's two more, plus Italy here and Portugal there. Um, and here we have the lion yes. of the Commonwealth. It's absolutely fantastic. And there's somebody, uh, looks as though they're grieving at the bottom there. Well, I mean, I suppose it's not surprising after the millions and millions that yes. were killed in the First World War. If you look in the distance, here we have the Germans fleeing the battlefield <laughs> after... Yes four or five years of, of bitter warfare. And it's interesting to see they're wearing this rather old-fashioned helmet, very much a sort of uh, a propaganda for the English to depict them always with this sort of spiked helmet. And you can just bake out the Zeppelin here. Yes. And of course, the sort of dreadnoughts on the right there. It's absolutely wonderful. I think it could do with a clean you're right. it's, it's quite yes. dirty, isn't it? Yes. And I yes. think you were quite surprised under the lights to how see... much more detail appeared. Yes. Can I ask what you paid for it? Well, I paid uh, £500, 500 pounds for it, which is probably not worth that now because it's so big and so dirty. Well, no, I think something like this today would be worth, well, I think at least £10,000. You, you don't. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's a. <laughs> it invokes a whole age, and I yeah. think there are museums and institutions that would want this picture. Right. And I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, my father had a large collection of 60 to well, 70 pieces like that. Did he really? Yes. And he built it up himself. He built it up himself. Yes. And of course, when he died, my mother had them. But when she died. She left instructions in her will that they were to be divided equally between all the children and grandchildren. No. Yes. So they are spread all over British Isles and possibly That's abroad. Now. Yes. So how many have you ended up with? That's what I've ended That's up with. So lot. everybody's got <coughs> about, about eight of them. 
Right. And the numbers refer to the probate. Right. We had them valued and he put little stickers on them so that we know which was which. How long ago was probate? 83. How did you get the ones you got? Was it divided for you or did no, you, you could they, pick? They were all left, they were all wrapped up in tissue paper and we took it in turns to take um, one all the what, way round. Wrapped the or Beatles. unwrapped? Wrapped they were. So you didn't know what you we were getting? We didn't know what we were getting. Really? Yes. yes. Do you reckon you did well or you did... Well, after that, some of them were, not, were unsigned and they're not very valuable and some of them were very valuable. So we did so a little bit of juggling so that we all had roughly the same value. Oh, uh, that's nice. Yes. OK. Well, the majority of them here are of 19th century date and they're, strictly speaking, they've moved away from being Netsky um, to being Okimono, to being decorative groups for the Western market. The ivory carvers had to do something when the Netsky went out of fashion and so they made these things for the Western market. And the majority of the pieces here um, are in the region of 100 to 300 pounds. But there's one star. I always understood that the water buffalo was the most valuable one. This one? Yes. You're right. <laughs> I think this is the most wonderful little carving. I mean, this really shows the skill of the Japanese Netsuki carver. It's fantastically well carved. It's not got the power, perhaps, of the earliest ones, but the way he's carved this backbone so that the, the vertebra show, the way the ribs show, the sensitive carving of the uh, hair on its back, the clever way this rope drapes round it, absolutely mm. brilliant. And typically, we've got as much going on on the underside as we have on the top side. And it's signed here, Tomatada. Now, Tomatada is one of the great names to reckon with in, with Natsuki carving, but there were a whole string of Tomatadas, Tomatada 1 to Tomatada 6, I think. And this is certainly not the great master himself, Tomatada the first. Um, it's somewhere down the line. But nevertheless, it's an absolutely fabulous bit of work. And I, I really think it's a, it's a star. Um, it's one of the nicest Netskis I've ever seen on the roadshow, I have to say. Um, you need to insure it. I think you need to put 5,000 pounds on. Of course. You were right, it's the star. <laughs> I think the reason I like it because it's an ox, and I was born in the year of the ox, so I thought oh, that is that really? is mine. Yes. Oh, that's brilliant! Yes. Oh, perfect! Very, very good. Yeah, you must hang on to that. And now it's time to say thank you to the people of Newport for keeping a welcome and for bringing us in their personal treasures. I must say that uh, my eye was particularly caught by those beautiful costumes from the 1920s and 30s. Did they ever really go out of fashion? Until next week, nostar and goodbye. <laughs>